You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to Courage to Overcome with your host, Cheryl Jennings. Each week, Cheryl will feature and discuss the many challenges of those living with disabilities, along with the various issues that are faced by their families that are caring for them. So now, please welcome the host of Courage to Overcome, Cheryl Jennings. Good evening. This is Courage to Overcome, and I am Cheryl Jennings your host. And as we are every week, we're so delighted that you've chosen to listen to this program. We are offering hope, suggestions, tips from people who have been caregivers for one reason or the other to try to make it easier for you if you have not been a caregiver yet, but you see it in your future. You know, we have so many baby boomers who are aging while they are still caring for their parents who are in their sometimes late 90s. And we know that it won't be long before the baby boomers will need to be cared for themselves. So there's a lot of information that floats around and there's always been so much information. It's kind of like overload and we don't know exactly what to think of everything. We're learning more about diseases and reasons that affect someone's inability to care for themselves, if it's a terminal illness, if it's a disease like Alzheimer's or dementia. And if you have a child with special needs and you become a caregiver, it is usually something that happens overnight, that you get a diagnosis, something changed your life, and now you're wondering, what do I do? How do I handle this job? It is just more than you ever thought that you were in for. But with our aging population, there are so many things that are becoming more available. One of those things is knowledge. And if we are aware that our parents are aging, there are some things that we can plan ahead to make that role go a lot easier. We know that parents just hate to give up driving a car. They don't want to move out of their homes. And sometimes those are decisions that are forced upon the family, and we don't really know what to do. And there is often a problem with a memory issue, if it's Alzheimer's, dementia, or something that could even be a problem that's caused by another reason in life. But we are always aware that those challenges make it more difficult for someone to make the decision that's best for them. And so families have to step in sometimes against the will of the parent and make that decision. So how can we make this easier for all of us, make it easier for the parents that we're not trying to take away something they're able to do, but help them to understand that sometimes we're going to get to the point ourselves that we're not going to be able to make those decisions that's best for us. And so tonight I have a very special guest because she is also a coach who is doing coaching to help families with dementia issues. And so I was delighted. I've just gotten to meet her and we shared a lot in common because we both love the people who are caregivers and we try to make the road that is difficult, easier than it has to be. If we just open our ears, open our eyes, and kind of see what's ahead and make some judgment calls about the preparation that can be done. And as she and I were talking, we were also mentioning that one of the biggest problems in life, no matter who you're talking to, is communication. 
Communication breaks down, especially between family members when a decision of whether or not you can continue to care for a parent or a spouse that has something like dementia or Alzheimer's, it gets to be very difficult because it's a very emotional decision. And it's not made easily for most people. But yet there are a lot of dimensions that are involved in this decision. And it could be that their siblings sit either want to take over or they don't want to have any part in that decision. It could be that we don't know exactly where to go to get the right information about what's the best place for them. Maybe it's not a memory care place. And we we start off there and then gradually have to move into a memory care facility that is providing more security for someone who might begin to wander. So there are so many issues that are surrounding this topic of dementia that tonight, my guest, Beaton, is going to be on here with me, and we are going to talk a little bit about how we can help families, what kind of things that we can, suggestions we can offer to family members who are already in this situation, and then to give you some tips if you're not there yet Listen carefully and take some notes because this information could very possibly save you a lot of heartache, a lot of tears, and certainly a lot of time trying to search for information that we might already know about. And I just want to say welcome to our show tonight, Beaton. I'm so glad that you're here with me. Oh, Cheryl, I am so pleased to be here with you. Everything you just said, absolutely resonates with me and I'm sure it does with a lot of people out there listening. So I am happy to be here and start talking. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's what we're (laughs) going to do tonight. And I just want to very briefly let you tell a little bit about why you got into coaching and caregiving and tell us, you know, the background just a little bit so we know who you are. Okay, I'd be happy to. Um, my mom had dementia. That is the bottom line, but I didn't know she had dementia. I lived in North Carolina at the time, some 10, 12, something years ago. And my mom lived in Florida and I was always close with my mom. So we would talk all the time, but it got to a point where she was calling me four, five, six times a day. And it was like we would hang up and the phone would, would ring and every call was the first time for her. And I just got this right. horrible feeling that something was wrong. And of course, when I said, Mom, oh, you know, we talked a little while ago, she would get angry because she was still in the early stages. So she felt that something was wrong, but she didn't want anyone telling her that, she, in her words, she was losing it. So... To make a long story short, things got worse. I moved to Florida uh, to help care for her. And this was before Google was Google. And, you know, today we can get on a keyboard and put in anything. And we get, oh, my gosh, you know what we get, a ton of uh, research information. But at that time, I was right. going to the library, calling people and talking to doctors. And the doctor, they told me, oh, your mom just has a little a little touch of senility. I'm like, how do you have a little touch of senility? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and it was really hard to know what was, how can I help my mom? Where do I go? Right. What can I do? What's available? And it, you know what it felt like, Cheryl? It was... Like, my mom and I were in this deep, dark forest, and it was really hard to see a path. And, you know, it was, right. it was scary. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's and the a lot of, of times, story. Well, and a lot of times when you begin down that journey and you don't know what's wrong and you're suspecting something's not right, I don't know what it is, but they are realizing it scares them because... They don't know either what is happening, and they are just realizing somebody's saying I'm wrong, I, and I I thought I knew what I was doing, and exactly. no, I haven't talked to you already. And and they feel yeah. very um, stressed out, and sometimes their anger is because 
they are they see everything slipping away from them. They're not the, going to be in control anymore. And so I found uh, some of those same issues. And it's hard. It causes tears a lot of times because you don't want to have any kind of a disagreement and you don't want to tell your mother something's not right. But you know something Absolutely. isn't right. And when you said a lot, what did you find? Something about loss of control. And that is what you hit the nail on the head. Because my mom was a very independent woman. And my dad had died 10 years ago. So she was living on her own. She was in her late 70s, early, she was in her early 80s at that time. And she was managing just fine until she wasn't managing just fine. She had. Then, you know, her bills weren't getting paid, and she would lock herself out of uh, her banking accounts, and and she would forget to move stuff off the stove, and things would get very hot. Right. And it was, yeah. And right. she would get, and then it was paranoia. Oh, there's somebody at my window. At the time, I didn't know what right. it was, but when I, you know, started studying, and it was signs of um, sundowning. She would always, you know, as the day started to end, the light changed and she would really start to get paranoid. And and it was so hard to see her way that way. And one of the things that I think is good about talking about it is that it helps somebody else to understand, oh, I'm not strange. I'm going through that, and I didn't know what it was. And I can remember there mm-hmm. were times that uh, if something happened like that with my mother and I came home, I'd be so sad and and tearful. And one of my friends who'd gone through Alzheimer's with her husband would say, now, honey, remember, it's just her brain talking. It's not your real mom. And that was so helpful to me That's because it important. helped me to realize Oh, it, absolutely. And that's one of the things that we can do for each other when we open up and talk about these things. And it's not that we are derogatory about anyone. We're simply facing the fact that when, if it's me or if it was you, that if we get dementia or Alzheimer's, we will begin to lose control because we won't know exactly what we've just done. And we could be Like you said, paranoid, thinking somebody is trying to come in and get in the house when the doors are locked and it's dark outside. Or think that everybody that comes in is trying to steal something from you, too. Exactly. Did you ever have to deal with those problems? Oh, gosh, yes. It was Somebody was uh, getting into her bank account. Somebody was uh, coming into her house and taking things and moving pictures around. And then one day... I was staying there with her, so I had gone out, and I came back in, and the back door was unlocked. And I said, Mom, um, we were going to keep the door locked. And this was before I realized, you know, you don't argue with somebody with dementia. You step into their reality, and you go there with them and work from there, from the inside out, basically. Well, she totally right, denied right. that the door was unlocked, and she says, no. I, oh, and then she switched and said, well, it doesn't matter because I'm safe here anyway. <laughs> it's like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> it's, uh, well, and know, those are just I know, hard things. Yeah, and, and today I would do it differently, and I tell my clients, you know, when somebody says that and stands on, I mean, you can look at the door, it's standing wide open, and they say, no, they didn't do it, although you saw them open the door, you say, oh, okay, um, why are the doors open? See, the door is open. Well, let's just go close it and have a cup of coffee. So you right, step away right. from the, the angst and the blaming and a lot of times you want to acknowledge, oh, my gosh, look at it. The door is open. The air is coming in or whatever. And, um, and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's happening. But when we start blaming or, you know, arguing with them, then, oh, you know, it goes to hell in a handbasket. And everybody winds up in tears. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, 
the communication is so critical and learning how to shift from what we usually do. As, as a matter of fact, let me just tell you a very short story. A friend of mine's mom is in the early stages of dementia and her dad's a client of mine. So he actually yells at his wife and uh, when she <laughs> sits in front of the computer and she likes to play solitaire. And he yells at her and tells her, no, you can't do this. You've got to come over here. And she starts to cry because he's bullying her. And he sits down uh -huh. and makes her or wants to make her do a crossword puzzle. She can't do that anymore. She used to love it and she was dynamite at it. But today she can't put well, the words together anymore. And, and one of the things about hey, that. This is not going to work. Yeah, right. But one of the things that's good for her is if she can go ahead and play solitaire, that's using her mind to think through and to at least keep it active in a way that she can instead of feeling bad. Oh, I can't do crossword puzzles. I can't do anything. And, you know, it would help a whole Absolutely. lot if people could realize that as we change, you know, my grandmother could do mm -hmm. crossword puzzles until she was in her 90s and then her mind was slipping. But I never could do the mm -hmm. crossword puzzles like her. But, you know, if we can well, just accept the fact either. that we're not all the same. <laughs> right. And if we're not all we're the not same, the we just same. don't need to argue. No, we but don't we don't need, need to, to make an and argument about all these things. Absolutely. Go ahead. Absolutely. And you know, a lot of times, like um, this this man at, who's yelling at his wife, part of that, and I've seen this time and time again, people get that angry and that bullying because they're afraid. They are so frightened. They're losing their loved one. Uh, they're seeing them right. slip away in front of their eyes, and they want to pull them back out of that dark fog that they don't know. They won't accept it's dementia. They call it by a name, but they don't accept the fact that, yes, the brain is diseased. There's something going on. She's losing her memory. She's losing her ability to be balanced. But he says, no, you've got to try hard. And, you've got and it hurts. I mean, yes. your heart hurts when you see this happen. Right. Yeah, and, so you know, you brought up some things on. that will be fun. Well, we're going to, uh, to need to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about this just a little bit more. But I'm so glad that people are with us tonight. And we will take this first break and we'll be back in just a moment. This is Courage to Overcome with Bold Brave Media. And we're glad you're here. We'll be back in a moment. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. 
frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. All right. We're just having a great discussion tonight talking about some of the issues that come about when our parents begin to lose some of their memory and how it affects their communication and it affects our communication with them, but it also causes them to begin to feel uneasy. They're losing control and they begin to get afraid sometimes of the wrong people or the wrong things. And then other times it's, we're just enjoying visiting a little bit about the things that we see that are so common about dementia. And I do want to say, Beatrice has had a lot of experience with this, not only with her own mother, but as a coach to help people who have been caring for their parents or a spouse that has some dementia issues. And one of those that we've already mentioned is that they will begin to call maybe one time after another and say, that's the first time. Or I know there were times that my mom would think I was in the house when I wasn't there anymore. I'd been there, but I'd left to go home. And she would tell my sister, no, she's in the house. She won't speak to me. Well, that wasn't real, but to her it was. So my sister would call and say, you need to call mother. She thinks you're still there. So I would call and just Mm -hmm. talk to her, and it would come up that she thought I was still there and didn't remember when I left. So, you know, those are things that are going to happen. And if you ever saw a picture of the brain, once the dementia and the Alzheimer's start setting in, you would understand why there are gaps in the memory, because there's literally holes that can develop in the brain that will keep the brain from connecting from one part to the other. And you mentioned something a little bit ago that I want to go back to. And you said that, you know, you have to step into their world. They're not going to step into yours. And even right. though you may be right about what's happening right now, you may be doing this very thing that they say, no, you're not. You mm-hmm. are not it's not going to help you at all to try to say you're winning an argument. An argument does nothing. It only scares them more and makes them more afraid to talk because they know something's not right, but they were sure they knew what was going on. And so when you argue, you scared them. And so that, that makes it harder to communicate with that person. So what are some tips that you found with, I mean, you mentioned one about stepping, just learning to shift the way you say something or shift that something has happened there. Tell us a little bit more about what you've helped other clients to see when this has happened to them. Okay. And you used a, a really great word, shift. Um, what I tell people, and this is, uh, I mean, just to imagine yourself standing with this person who's maybe standing or sitting, whatever, but to physically just be quiet for a moment and take a step either left or right, and your perspective will change. Sounds simple, right? And I've had uh, it does. recently a, a client <laughs> actually came back to me and said, Beata, oh, my gosh, I was having this argument, and her husband has recently died. And But she said, I was talking to my brother, and we were having an argument, and, and I literally moved over into a different box on the floor, you know, a square on the floor. And she said, and I wasn't angry anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Try it sometime. It really works. Now, let me tell you, though, um, and this, it, it touched my heart so much, and I think it will, anyone who's listening, um, there was a man who, had, he had, his wife had died eight years prior, and he had dementia. 
and he was in a care facility. And he would consistently ask the staff, please call my wife. I need to talk to her. Uh, please call my wife. She's waiting at home for me. She needs to come pick me up. And they would tell him, Pete, your wife has died. She's been gone a long time and you live here. This is your home. They're being very, very logical, uh, very detailed. They showed him all the, you know, this is where you live. This is a picture of your wife. She's no more. And it didn't make a dent. And then we came up right. with a different technique. I said, all right, let's try this. It was, all right, Pete, I hear you're talking about your wife. You're missing your wife, aren't you? And he stopped. And he literally broke into tears. And oh. I said, okay, tell me about your wife. Tell me a little bit. And so he went on and on and on to tell how they met, how wonderful she was. Or he was using the present tense. And then he got quiet and he said, I know she's dead, isn't she? Oh. And the thing of it is that all this time he was grieving for his wife. And he was not able to do so because nobody let him. They tried to push him on. You know, okay, she's gone. You got to move on. And the interesting thing is he was able in that moment to remember her, to grieve for her, to love her memory. And he never mentioned her again. It was done. Wow. Isn't that something? See, and that was something. Yes, and it didn't hurt them to be able to let him feel that moment. And to accept the fact that he needed to to see what happened. And and it's it's really hard because you miss the person that's gone that's standing in front of you and they're not the same person mm -hmm. that you knew. Absolutely. But they yeah. miss the people they remember. One of my yes, friends had a husband who had Alzheimer's. Go ahead. So they need time to grieve too. And when we validate their feelings, and that's so important, we validate what they're feeling, we acknowledge where they are. Those are two really important words to validate and acknowledge. That's that, great. yes, you're feeling that's this. Great. Yes, I understand. You're feeling sad. You're missing her. Um, whatever the emotion may be, and, you know, reflect it back. You're mirroring what that person is feeling and acting and then let him go through his process and you know sometimes people don't have the words anymore and then you kind of do other things but when there's still words then this can really work oh I mean it's, it's just so heart heart centered it's just like, you know, my heart blew wide open when well, that happened. <laughs> so, well, and we yeah. we all want to have our thoughts and our feelings validated. We want people to listen exactly. to us and to accept that what we say. So we're just allowing them to experience their own emotions in that way and validate. Yes, you are grieving, aren't you? You are missing her. But you know, it mm -hmm. is it is so sad when I see people that are always arguing are trying to correct somebody on a just a regular basis. They never allow them to have their own thoughts because they're trying to get them to change their thoughts to match what it is. And one of my friends that took care of her husband in such a wonderful way uh, was telling me one time, said, you know, her husband asked her one day, said, where's my wife? And she said, well, I'm standing in front of you. And he said, no, 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 I mean my other wife. And she thought a minute and she said, I, I realized neither one of us had been married before, and he was looking for me like I looked when I was young. And she just went along with yes. him and said, oh, I'll go get her after a while. And that's all it took to relieve that situation. Yes. And if he would say, well, I want to go home, 
And that, you know, most people argue and go, well, you are home. This is where you live now. You know, you don't live there anymore. And all exactly. she would say is, oh, we'll, we'll do that after a while. And just accept the fact that it is mm-hmm. what it is. They're not going to change their reality, but they have stepped back in time to be in a different time and space. And we need to allow them to do that. I want to stop here just for a moment and tell people that if you would like to uh, get more information about dementia, like she said, there are things on the Internet. But if you want to write us, then before the end of the program, we'll be giving you a way to reach us. So we'll let you go to commercial now and get that paper and pencil ready. So we'll be back in just a moment. For over 50 years, Evelyn Stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. President and founder of Big Heart Bridges, her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing, transportation, and employment. Ms. Stapula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapoulis drives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305 705 3428 or email her at Renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. All right. Well, I hope you got a drink water and you've got your paper and pencils because we will be telling you how you can reach us before the end of the program. One of the things, though, that I did want to just bring up here is that this is a common problem for parents that are getting older to get dementia or Alzheimer's. But I have known people in their 40s to even get this problem. So I, my daughter has a good friend who's um Her husband got dementia before he was 40, and he was a CEO of a company. So I hope that we can all be just very involved in helping to get the, uh, encourage the uh, research and encourage that we find out the answers to some of these problems that we know are growing day by day in the number of people that are having to deal with this. It's not easy on the person that becomes incapacitated if even if it's in their minds or if it's their bodies it's not easy on the family members and there's a lot of heartache mm-hmm. and a lot of uh, sometimes there's there's guilt that's involved with because we don't understand when the, the changes first happen we don't recognize what it is and this can also lead to some blame game and like you were mentioning a while ago it can also you know bring about some bad communication and instead of this i believe that people are more open to learning uh what to expect with some of the diseases than they used to be we have more information available. And thank goodness we don't have to go back to just going to a library and looking something up because by the time a book is written and it arrives on a shelf somewhere, it's already out of date. And so many of the uh, research, uh, so much of the research about the brain has changed over the years. I know from when I was at Sam Houston, psychology was my minor. And 
the amount of information that we now know about the brain is totally opposite of what they thought when I was in school. I've gone to listen to some of the people who are top in the field of the study of the brain with Alzheimer's or dementia. And so it's fascinating. And it's something that we need to be prepared for that it could happen to us. So how are we going to recognize some of these symptoms? And what are we going to do if it happens to us and the family starts telling us, you don't remember what happened? You didn't remember you just called me? Mm -hmm. How are we going to react? So maybe the learning process in this is, is to really be able to help prepare ourselves for the needed care we may need to receive someday. Because it is heartbreaking for family members who have to come to the conclusion, I can no longer deal with this in the home. And if it comes to that, we have to learn not only to deal with somebody uh, finding an appropriate placement for them, we have to now learn how to find finances. It changes everybody's life. And uh, many times there is no preparation for these uh, problems like long-term care because many of the people that have this problem either never thought they were going to have it or they didn't have the money to put away for long-term care. They barely had enough to take care of today, much less long time down the road. So what are some of the mm-hmm. things that you have thought of that you might just share with with us about when someone first has to be placed in a memory care place, what do you tell the family that comes to you and they're all upset? How does that go? Okay, I'm going to step back just a little bit because um, okay. that, that itself is a process. And you mentioned something about um, it's a learning process. You know, How do we react when mom, dad, whoever starts calling or repeating uh, the same thing over and over. And the, what, what we want to acknowledge, and this is so hard because we see it, you know, when you're close to the forest, you don't see the trees. And I've seen this even in my own family. When my mom started having these weird behaviors, I was starting to figure out what it was, but the rest of my family was in deep, dark denial, and denial is not a river in Egypt. (laughs) No, it's like right, totally (laughs) ignored this. Um, Yes, and I've also learned, I may not have the best sense of humor, but that humor is absolutely the one thing that can carry us through some of the hardest times. So don't ever forget how to laugh and smile. That's very important. Yeah, and the denial part is actually a part of the the process. Some, you know, the behavior starts to change, and the family around them, it's like deny, 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 because no, 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 it really isn't happening. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, a friend of mine whose husband recently died, um, she covered up for her husband for five years. Before she wow. ever told anyone, oh, there is something wrong, because he was doing things that she just couldn't hide anymore. And here's what happens almost 99.99% of the time. The people that are your friends or your family will say, yeah, Beata, yeah, Sandy, or I thought something has been going on. They know. They know before you acknowledge right. that you know. Yeah. So here's the thing. Right. When we actually say this is going on, it's more possible to get help sooner than later. You know? And that's the thing right. that I try to help my uh, clients with. It's like, okay, come on now. Now, you were asking what happens when somebody needs to go into a care facility. Well, when they get to a point where um, they can no longer be cared for at home, whether it's um, uh, you have a, 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 a you know a short white, slim, a short, and the man is six foot five and broad shoulders, 
and he falls, she's not going to be able to pick him up, right? And right. this also goes to the caregiver taking care of themselves. We forget as caregivers that we have to take care of ourselves because if we don't, who's going to be there for our loved one? And the statistics on caregiver show That's are right. horrendous. You probably know them. But I'll give you the worst one first. 63% of older caregivers taking care of their loved ones died before the ones they're caring for. That's very right. horrible. So the message right. here is we got to take care of the caregiver. We really do. And in uh, put, and talking about um, placement, okay, uh, says so the husband that has dementia and the family gathers around says, okay, mom can no longer take care of dad at home. Uh, he's starting to wander. He got out the door. He wandered down the street. Uh, or, you know, he's leaving the pot on the stove with the fire turned on, or whatever it is, it just becomes not safe. And there have also been cases, and I had a client uh, recently whose husband, it was a case of she was this tiny little thing, and he's a big ex-Marine, and he was standing at the sink one day, and she turned to her and out of nowhere and raised his fist at her. And she was like, oh, my gosh, what happened? You know? oh. And then a second later, it was gone. But it was enough for her to reach out and get some more help than she was getting. Because she was terrified. And it's the brain disease. Well, it's not and that the happens. Person. Right. And we can't really emphasize that too much either because – and what you said about the family covering up for them, that happens a lot because it's almost yeah. like people feel ashamed that this happens mm -hmm. to a loved one, but it's nothing to be ashamed about. And one of the things that I've heard people talk about is, you know, feeling guilty about maybe they did something that caused this to happen. That really does not help anybody to be able to cope better when you're trying to think, oh, well, they just didn't eat this or they didn't take away something that they should have had. You know, once you've got that disease, it's the disease of the brain and you are, you're not doing them any good or yourself any good feeling bad about what's happened to them. You know, I, I can remember when our son was born and he had cerebral palsy that we didn't know for 14 months. But even when we got the diagnosis, mm -hmm. we were still thinking, well, did I take all my vitamins? Did I do this? Did I do that? And you first have this denial, and then you have this guilt because you think, well, maybe I didn't do something right. That does not help mm -hmm. anybody in being able to be a better caregiver. So if we can support the families in knowing that when this happens, as early as you can, try to reach out and get help. And the only person that might be able to help them will be the family doctor, the one that can really talk to them in a very quiet and loving way about how they are not able to do what they used to do. And that we all are wanting safety and they're Safety is our biggest concern because, like you said, if they're uh, putting something on the stove and it gets too hot or a lamp is too close to, like, the bed and it's close to a pillow mm -hmm. where it could catch on fire or, you know, even things that they are used to doing but now they can't do, we just need to watch out for them because, even the medical alert may not save them if they don't remember they even have it on. And that's something that right. you don't really think about when you get a medical alert. But if you are someone dealing with brain issues, you may not remember and you may lay there when needing help, but you don't even know to call for help. I need to just tell people real quickly that if you are interested in getting the book, It Takes Courage to Be a Caregiver, that is for sale on Amazon. And it covers a lot of the information that 
we've had over the months, uh, over almost two years of doing some interviews with people and learning things like we're learning tonight, how to better take care of these issues of caregiving. And so if you are wanting to get more information, some tips and answers to help you, if it's from a child to an adult, that book will, it was written with you in mind. And we're going to take one more break, but when we come back, we will give you a way to reach us after the program tonight. So we'll be back in just a moment. For over 50 years, Evelyn Stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. President and founder of Big Heart Bridges, her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing, transportation, and employment. Ms. Stapula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee for People with disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapoulis drives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. Hi, my name is Myra Fox, and I am a survivor. I am the founder of the Castle Lewis I Survived Foundation and the author of a series of books entitled I Survived a Murder Untold, which tells the story of my sister and I who were abandoned and left in the care of a woman who beat us repeatedly. Unfortunately, it resulted in the death of my sister, Castle Lewis, which is revealed in a page-to-page chilling story. After spending time in the foster care system, I've documented my suffering and my loss and ultimately my survival. I'm blessed to work daily in my community and surrounding areas to give back by helping others and feeding the homeless. I want to spread awareness of the dangers of abuse. You can purchase my books and contribute to the Castle Lewis I Survive Foundation by visiting www.castlelewis.com or you can call us at 540-999-8401. Thank you. Okay, this has been a very interesting program to be able to talk about how our bodies change, how our minds change, how it affects not only us, but the people that love us the most. And I know that there are so many baby boomers, we, and I am one of them, and it is amazing to see how many baby boomers are still active, but still caring for a parent and maybe helping care for children or grandchildren, sometimes great-grandchildren, but we have to face the fact that we're not always going to be in the physical or mental health of being able to do that. And so when we're not able to, who do we go to? Who do we call? And I mentioned that sometimes a doctor may be the one that can help us, but let me get your thoughts on this. What do you think? If a doctor is not up on what is the real reason here? Tell us a little bit about how you'd approach that. And that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that, Cheryl. Uh, The family doctor may or may not really know enough about dementia or Alzheimer's to make that diagnosis. So the thing that um, you might need to do is say, doctor, I'd like a referral to somebody that can do the diagnostics on my loved one. That would mean blood tests, uh, genetic tests, perhaps uh, scans, all kinds of things, and find out really is this dementia or is it something else? And I say something else because there are other things that can mimic all the signs of dementia. And once that is corrected, the signs and symptoms of dementia go away and your person will come back to being who he is. Some of those things are urinary tract infections, uh, medication interactions, right. any kind of infections, uh-huh. um, maybe um, head trauma or, you know, there's so many different things. And you don't want to be satisfied with that little piece of paper where uh, 
some doctors have given my my people these things and you know where you have to draw the clock with the numbers on it instead of falling off you say yeah you have to mention no that's not enough we want to know because that diagnosis changes the life now the other thing is you can also right do things that will uh, slow down the process you can prevent possibly the onset of Alzheimer's or dementia by, you know, nutrition and doing other things. And there are studies in place, protocols in place, that have shown that these things are possible. So dementia is no longer necessarily uh, a disease, you know, diagnosis that is terminal. So there are lots of that's, things that's going true. on out there. It's like, yay, it's awesome stuff. And I want to make sure, I would love to tell everybody all about it, but it takes too long. Next time. <laughs> or you can, you know, we're going to give them <laughs> well, some I heard uh, one contact of the, information. Right? right. I want you to be sure and give them a way to reach you because there might be people listening who would like to ask you some other questions or get in touch with you. Go ahead. Okay. My email is my first name, Beata. B as in boy, E-A-T-E-J-A-N at gmail.com. It's Beata Jansen, but Beata Jan at gmail. And I'll also give you my phone number. All right? Write it down. 919-413-7983. So 919-413-7983. Or B E A T E J A N at gmail dot com, and I'll be very happy to that's great talk to you, write to you, and tell you anything you want to know. <laughs> we need to get this information well, out there. That is Cheryl, so sweet. Awesome. That's right. Well, you're awesome, Cheryl. You. I appreciate you being a part of this. this. Yeah, thrilled to be here. Well, thank you. Really, thank you. <laughs> well, You're and we still want to emphasize that this program this program is all about trying to help people see hope in their lives, be able to show them you just have to step up sometimes and have some courage to face the problem that is in front of you. And it could be this very problem that you're going to have to deal with. So when you do, it's not like she said, it doesn't have to be a death sentence or this is, there is no hope for this because I even went to a production where in California about a year ago that I watched one of the top brain doctors show pictures of the brain with Alzheimer's. And after he gets through working with them for just a short time with nutrition, how he was able to help the brain to heal. And it was amazing. He's the very doctor that actually found what happened to the guys who are playing football with the concussions. And so it was very interesting to see that program. And we can't tell you everything all in one hour, but I can tell you, I'm so glad that you tune into this program. And if you'd like to share this with somebody else or get people to listen to this program, all you have to do is go to boldbravemedia.com slash the word shows, S-H-O-W-S, a slash, and then the name of this program, which is courage dash the number two dash overcome courage dash two dash overcome if this program is also on iheart it's on tune in radio you can get this on several different stations but you need to go to bold brave media to find the programs that are there and just go at the appropriate time and for this program it's monday nights nine o'clock eastern 7 o'clock Mountain Time, 6 o'clock Pacific, and I happen to be in the great place of Central Time Zone, <laughs> which is Oklahoma, and I am delighted that I get to do this with the help of a wonderful 
engineer that's in New York helping make this show possible. And I appreciate all the work that Abraham does on a weekly basis, helping me stay on track and be able to share all of this information. If you'd like to know how to reach us, you can go there. You can find the information or you can just write to me, Cheryl Jennings, G-I-N-N-I-N-G-S at gmail.com. And I'm always glad to have people on the program to interview because I learn a lot when I'm listening to how other people have handled problems and they share information that maybe they've worked a long time to know. But one thing about it, we're always eager to help you, the audience, understand how to live with more courage in your life, to not throw up your hands and say, I can't do this. And so much of what we deal with in life all goes back to communication. And one of the things that we see on a regular basis is that communication breaks down when families have to deal with some huge challenge, a big obstacle that they're coming up against. And it's simply just not understanding each other very well. And I just give you this quick little example because I know our time's almost up, but if you were a woman, you just had a baby, you found out the baby has special needs, and you and your husband are very upset, maybe in denial, but then you begin to try to cope with what's there. And you weren't prepared for this issue. You may think, I just can't do this by myself. And he thinks, I've got to go to work. I've got to support the family. But you look at him and think, well, if he really felt as bad as I did, he'd stay home with me because I need him to support me. And he's thinking, I dread going home because she's going to fuss at me because I had to go and earn a living to take care of the family. And you see how we're just watching each other, just in a, a not seeing each other truly in the suffering they're in. So that's just one example. We will give you examples every week. I hope you'll tune in next week to Courage to Overcome on Bold Brave Media. Looking forward to talking to you next week. Thank you for turning in and good night. You've been listening to Courage to Overcome with your host, Cheryl Jennings. Be it Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, or autism. Listen each week for an informative look into the lives of those challenged by these and other disabilities today on the next episode of Cheryl Jennings' Courage to Overcome. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company. 